dislike telling my story because it almost doesn't sound real. LOL. Got a rooftop tent for my Jeep from my girlfriend recently. We drive out to her family's property and stay like a hundred yards into the woods behind her grandmother's house on a trail that's been cut. We're like an hour from the nearest town, middle of nowhere. Around 3 a.m. I wake up due to the Jeep shaking. It wasn't much but enough to wake me. At first, I thought it was my girlfriend moving around, but the Jeep shakes again and I could tell she hadn't moved at all. Jeep shakes a couple more times, then I hear the metal panel of either my front passenger door or front quarter panel warping in. I wake my girlfriend up. She confirms something outside shaking the Jeep. At this point, I was praying for anything besides a person because I didn't have my glasses or gun with me and it was a new moon phase, so it was completely dark out. We never looked outside to see what it was, never figured it out. Never heard nails or anything touch the Jeep and never heard footsteps at any point. I set the car alarm off to try and run. Off. Whatever it was. I didn't sleep the rest of the night. Another story I have is staying in central Mississippi. Literally every twenty minutes multiple packs of coyotes would howl for minutes in every direction. At times it was so loud I thought they were circling the Jeep or within fifty feet from us. But we never actually saw them. This was a really cool trip because although I've heard coyotes before, it was never so many, so loud or so frequently nearby. We didn't sleep all night because we simply couldn't with the noise. Our group of seasoned hunters embarked on the expedition in the uncharted wilderness. We sought the ultimate hunting experience a test of our skills against the raw power of nature. As we ventured deeper into the dense forest, our senses heightened, tracking our prey with a keen eye. But something felt amiss. The forest was eerily silent, as though it held its breath in anticipation of something sinister. Before long, we realized we were not the only hunters in this wilderness. An unknown predator was stalking us, picking off my companions one by one. The tables had turned, and we were now the hunted. I watched in horror as my friends fell victim to the mysterious creature. Their screams echoed through the forest, haunting me with every step I took. I knew that I had to act fast if I was to have any chance of survival. As the last remaining hunter, I resolved to devise an ingenious trap. Drawing upon my knowledge of the predator's behavior and preferences, I scavenged natural materials from the woods and fashioned them into realistic decoys. Using the limited time I had, I strategically placed these decoys around the hunting area, hoping to lure the predator into a false sense of security. My heart raced as I concealed myself nearby, watching the predator cautiously approach the decoys. The creature was unlike anything I had ever seen before. A monstrous amalgamation of man and beast, with razor-sharp claws and eyes that glinted with a malevolent intelligence. As the predator moved between the decoys, its attention completely focused on them, I seized my opportunity. Moving silently and swiftly, I approached the creature undetected, adrenaline coursing through my veins. As I closed in, I sprang my trap ensnaring the beast in a net fashioned from vines and branches. It roared in fury and thrashed violently, but the more it struggled, the tighter the net became. With the predator captured, I sent out a distress signal, hoping that someone would come to my aid. It wasn't long before a government team arrived, their presence a stark contrast to the wild beauty of the forest. They contained the creature, whisking it away to some secret facility, leaving me to ponder the events that had transpired. Two years ago, I was camping with my ten-year-old and her friend. We were screwing around, dancing, and I stood up too fast, got lightheaded, and fell face first into the fire. My forehead hit the fire ring, and I plunged my arms into the coals. I launched myself out of fire immediately, but my shirt was on fire, and my head was a bloody disaster. As soon as I saw the amount of blood on the towel I put to my head, I thought 
It was 10.30 p.m. Had the girls dump all our water on the fire, grabbed my phone and keys, and quickly hiked us out to the car. I left everything else behind, including my glasses and wallet. The girls were crying. I started driving towards home and called 911 to ask where I should even go. Turns out that the closest ER was actually where we lived, 45 minutes away. So I drove home in the dark through a bunch of construction without my glasses and shock and bleeding profusely. I made phone calls on the way to have my husband and the other child's mom meet us at the hospital. It wasn't until the ER nurses started wrapping me up in sarin wrap that I realized that I had a bunch of burns, including second-degree burns on my arms and hands. That shit was crazy, and I had the gnarly scars to prove it. I have always been drawn to the natural beauty and rugged wilderness of Yellowstone National Park. From the towering geysers and bubbling hot springs to the sprawling meadows dotted with elk and bison, the park is a true wonder of the world. But as a park ranger, I also know that the seemingly peaceful wilderness holds many dangers and secrets, especially in the remote and untamed back country. I had been working as a ranger for several years, but I had never encountered anything like the terror I faced on a routine patrol in the summer of 2022. I had been making my way through a dense forest near the north boundary of the park when I heard a blood-curdling roar that echoed through the trees. At first I thought it was a grizzly bear, but as the sound grew closer, I realized that it was something much more sinister. I caught a glimpse of a massive, hairy figure moving through the trees, and I knew that I was face to face with Bigfoot. I tried to defend myself with my pepper spray, but the creature was unfazed. It charged at me with astonishing speed and knocked me to the ground, pinning me with its massive arms. I was sure that I was going to die, but somehow I managed to wriggle free and make a run for it. I stumbled through the forest, dodging trees and tripping over roots, until I came upon an old cabin in the woods. I stumbled inside and locked the door, panting and shaking with fear. As I caught my breath, I realized that the cabin was not abandoned. There was someone inside, a Native American man who introduced himself as a park ranger like myself. He told me that he had been tracking Bigfoot for years and had finally found evidence of its existence in the park. At first I was relieved to have found another ranger and someone who could help me get back to safety. But as the night wore on, I began to suspect that he was not what he seemed. He seemed to take a sadistic pleasure in recounting tales of Bigfoot attacks, and I noticed that he was always looking at me with a strange gleam in his eye. I soon realized that he was not a ranger at all, but a crazy Bigfoot fanatic, who had lured me to the cabin with the intention of killing me. I was trapped in the cabin with this madman, with Bigfoot lurking outside and no way to call for help. I knew that I had to get out of there before it was too late. I waited until he had fallen asleep, and then I made my escape. I ran through the woods, dodging trees and tripping over roots, until I finally stumbled upon a park road. I flagged down a passing car and was rescued. The authorities were skeptical of my wild story. But after a thorough investigation, they found evidence of Bigfoot tracks and the remnants of the old cabin in the wood. The man who had attacked me was arrested and charged with attempted murder. I was hailed as a hero, but the memory of that terrifying night still haunts me. Despite my close encounter with Bigfoot, I couldn't stay away from Yellowstone. The park holds a special place in my heart, and I knew that I had to return to continue my work as a ranger. I now carry a firearm for protection, and I never venture into the back country without a partner. But I also know that no matter how many precautions I take, there will always be dangers lurking in the wilderness. Me and four of my buddies drew into a two-day hunt on a reserve. Day one, about 8.30 in the morning, about 500 yards from my spot, my buddy filmed a fat black bear. We only had muzzleloaders. They're like a Civil War-style gun. You get one shot, 
Then you gotta reload with a ramrod and stuff. I never saw any deer so at 2 p.m. after lunch, me and another buddy scout for a new spot. We find a hylacious animal trail and he drops me off. I tell him, pick me up, he'll be on the road after dark. He's about seven miles away. I sit there from 2 p.m. till dark, all I see are loads of elk. The trail wasn't deer, it was elk highway, so it gets dark and I creep down to the road. Right at dusk, almost too dark to see something crashes in the thick bushes about 30 yards in front of me across the road. I think I'm the, maybe it's a deer. So I grunt the call just to get a reaction. Nothing. So I creep on it thinking I can bust it if it's a deer. It doesn't budge, he's just sniffing like a dog. Sniff, sniff, sniff. I kick the ground and stomp trying to bump it. It just keeps sniffing. I remember that bear and I'm ten feet from whatever this is. I slowly back into a feed plot behind me with my one shot at my hip. I'm going to have to hip shoot it if it's a bear. I get fifty yards in the middle of a field plot, a big bull elk off to my right, then the full moonlight. I see something drive out of the bushes into the thicket across the road to my left, so I run further out. It's a standoff. I shine my light into the thicket, and I see eyes reflecting back. They look eight inches apart, four foot off ground. It's just sniffing over and over. I'm like, where's my bro? It's full dark, and this thing is stalking me using cover. My buddy lights start shining down the road, and this thing crashes through the bushes away. I figure it's a bear, but I don't know. I was turtle-heading, I'm not gonna lie. I had one shot in the dark. Coyotes howling like crazy, too. Predators were out in full effect on the full moon night. Flash flood in the middle of the night at Hunter's Canyon near Moab, Utah. We were camped near the river bed, which was about four feet deep and twenty feet across. Before the sun set there were about two inches of water, maybe one, two feet across, trickling through. It was only lightly raining, but by midnight the entire river bed was full. Some of our friends we were camping with had let their two boys pitch a tent on the other side of the river and the water was lapping at their tent and they weren't sure if the boys knew what was happening. Fortunately, the river stopped before it consumed their tent. Nearby us a dirt road that led to a lot of other camping places crossed the river. It was the first night of spring break for a bunch of colleges, and so there were a lot of people coming in late trying to get to campsite. A huge line started to build up of cars waiting for the river to go down so they could cross. One guy with a minivan decided to wade out into the river to see how deep it was to see if he could cross. All of a sudden he yells. We thought maybe he had slipped and was going to be carried away, but it turns out he had been carrying his keys in his hand and dropped them. We helped him look for them for a while, but eventually gave up. He ended up having to get the minivan towed into town a few days later. I don't think the keys got washed too far away because we would periodically hear the minivan beep or honk like the fob was in range and was being short-circuited by the water. I want to preface this with the fact that I did not get a good look at what we encountered. I saw a glimpse and I don't want to make any assumptions on what it may or may not have been. Two of my friends and I used to be stationed at Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas, and we decided a Memorial Day camping weekend would be a good idea. So we took a trip up to Monjo Peak outside of Ruidoso, them. We planned to stay for three nights, the first two of which were very relaxing. On our first day, there when we're deciding where to set up our tent, we found loads of bones from various animals. Not mounded up, or anything like they were collected. Just bones all around the campsite. The campsite had five places to pitch tents over about 300 square meters. We decided to pitch our tents on the highest point at the campsite, about 30-40 feet higher elevation than the parking lot shown on the map have included to the bottom of my post. On the third night, it was well after sunset when all noise from the woods died out. I'm not sure how long it was silent before me and my friends broached the subject, but it wasn't long after that. 
that the hair on the back of my neck started to stand, followed by goosebumps all over. I could see my friends starting to get jittery, and from one of the other campsites we heard their two dogs going absolutely apeshit. These were very relaxed and happy dogs for the last two days. We had also made decent acquaintances with the couple who had the dogs, and they had lunch with us on day two. The other two groups that were camping at the same time had gone silent as well. The car was about 60 meters from our campsite, and we unanimously decided to go get our guns. AR-15s and 9mm pistols. On our way back, we started to smell a rotting, fetid stench. I don't know if anyone has ever had to burn feces before, but it smelled like that mixed with death. It was cloying and felt like it was almost physical, it was so strong. We got back to our campsite and decided to post guard all through the night, one man up and two asleep, or at least resting. At least resting? I volunteered for the first shift because I knew I wasn't getting any rest at all. We had plenty of firewood for the night especially because we were leaving the next morning. I kept the fire blazing as much as I could because I figured that if it was some sort of animal, it wouldn't be too interested in messing with me. I kept my back to the fire so I could maintain good night vision. As you can see in on the maps, the forest to the southwest of our campsite was pretty burnt out, but what you can't see very well is the elevation change. Once you got into the tree line, it was very steep, not impassable by any means, but not somewhere you need to be walking at night. Behind the trees I noticed was a stark white shape. I shouldered my rifle, and it didn't move at all. I assumed it was a tree partially hidden tree behind another one. I started scanning the tree line with a flashlight because I felt the stench was stronger than it was before. As my beam passed over what I thought was the obscured tree, I saw eye shine from the white shape. As soon as I registered what I was seeing, it disappeared behind the tree. I debated investigating, but instead just roused my friends, and we scanned together. When my shift ended, I took off my rain fly on my tent so I could see out it needed. I didn't see anything on my next shift, just the smell. In the morning, just before dawn, broke the smell seemed to recede, but only so much almost like it left a scent as a warning was the impression that I got. We broke camp and started packing up. About halfway through our breakdown, we saw the other three groups packing up as well. I went over and talked to the couple with the dogs, asking them if they saw anything last night, or if their dogs calmed down after the barking stopped. They told me that even when they stopped barking, the dogs didn't sleep. They spent the night whining and growling in the direction of the hill to the southwest. No one would ever believe me. But I want to share this story because I talked about it yesterday for the first time. I'm sorry for any typos you see. English is not my native language. I live in northern Europe. My country is cold and covered by a large forest and several lakes. My family consists of mother, father, and an older brother who is three years older than me. He's really important in the story. It's also important to know that my parents' house was in the middle of nowhere. Just forest around it. There aren't even proper roads or any street light. The nearest neighbor lives really far away. In my country, winter comes early and lasts longer than summer, so the days are dark almost all year round. My father is a fireman, and my mother is a nurse, so they have always been on night shifts. They have left me and my brother home alone since we were just toddlers. I don't know if it's even legal to leave us alone, but my brother has always been good at taking care of me. This particular evening was close to Christmas. Both of us were on winter break, but my brother still went to ice hockey practice. He was really tired that night after practice. Father and mother had gone to work at night and left us alone. I was eight at the time, and my brother was eleven. We often slept next to each other downstairs in our parents' bed. 
but I decided to be a big girl that night and sleep in my own bed upstairs. I really just wanted to play my Nintendo, and I knew my brother wouldn't let me. My brother was so tired after training, and he just wanted to go to sleep. We ate, brushed our teeth, and went to our rooms upstairs. My room faced the forest, and his room faced the only dirt road. There is a hall and toilet between our rooms. My brother must have fallen asleep right away, but I played and played. I played for so long that I lost track of time. I was under my covers in case my brother came to scold me. I started to hear something outside. However, I didn't pay attention to it at first. I've lived all my life in the middle of the forest. You can hear voices from there all the time. The small noises changed in a second. Someone started shouting, almost screaming. It sounded like a grown man who was wounded. I lifted my head from under the covers, startled, and listened for a moment. I called out my brother's name, but he didn't answer. I got up from my bed and ran to my brother's room. He slept soundly. I started rocking him awake. At the same time, I saw from his alarm clock that it was two in the morning. My brother woke up confused. Do you hear that? I asked in a whisper. My brother's eyes widened and all sleep vanished from his eyes. He sprang up. He didn't say anything. He walked towards my room. The shouting came from somewhere in the forest. We stood together in my room and stared out into the darkness. I think someone needs help, I said quietly, but my brother's expression didn't change. His face was like stone. No, no one needs the help of two kids. Besides, if he needed help, he would be screaming for help. My brother turned around. He was right. I heard no words, just a screaming. My brother walked downstairs, and I ran after him. Our house has three doors. He tried each of them to make sure they were locked. He took our father's headlamp because it had the strongest light. Then he picked up the house phone. It was 2010, so not all the kids had their own phones. He made sure all the lights were off and took my hand. He started to lead us back upstairs. Then he stopped. The shouting had changed. It no longer sounded scared or needy for help. It sounded irritated, almost angry, like it was annoyed that we didn't come out looking for it. My brother squeezed my hand and pulled me upstairs. He stared at my room for a moment before he pulled me into his room with him. He closed the door and sat behind his bed, pulling me into his arms. It was dark everywhere. My brother hadn't turned on the headlamp, but he had 112 ready on the phone, our country's emergency number. We sat there in silence. The sound had come closer until it was clearly behind the window of my room. We heard someone banging on my window. I started to sob. My brother stroked my head to calm me down, but it didn't help. I was so scared. The sound seemed to be coming closer and closer. It had climbed the fire escape under my window and was now traveling along the rain gutters towards my brother's window. Then it became quiet. It stopped screaming, but we could hear it clinging to the rain gutters to get closer to us. Then it was too quiet. My brother turned on the headlamp and pointed the light towards his window. Nothing. He turned off the light and waited a moment. Then he pointed the light at the window again. Nothing. He turned it off and waited. He pointed the light at the window. Nothing. He turned it off. Then there was a big crash. As if a big pile of snow had dripped from the roof down to the terrace. My brother flashed the light in the window. There was something on it. The kind of trace that is left when you breathe too close to the glass, in cold weather. There was a trace of mist on it. My brother immediately turned off the light. Whatever it was, it had fallen down because my brother's window has nothing to hold on to. We started hearing moaning. It sounded only partially human anymore. It sounded more like a bear. If you've ever heard the sound a bear makes when it's been shot, that is what it sounded like. But it had a touch of man. Then the voice became angry again. It threw a full tantrum. It started hitting the wall of the house. I squeezed my eyes shut and 
pressed my head against my brother's shirt. It raged for a while, but started to whine and moan again. It no longer sounded human at all. I can't describe what it was like, but it didn't sound natural. My brother dropped the headlamp on the floor and hugged me tightly. We listened to the sound for quite a long time. I don't remember at what point I fell asleep, but I woke up in the morning. The beautiful morning sun reflected against the white snow. <sighs> I was laying on my brother's bed, and he was sitting next to me, reading comics. He smiled, and I'd been dreaming. I didn't have time to say anything when we heard the lock on the front door open. It was nine o'clock. Dad had come home. My brother cheerfully jumped out of bed and ran to greet Dad downstairs. Maybe I had a nightmare and went to sleep next to my brother. It doesn't sound impossible, especially since my brother didn't mention it in the morning. I convinced myself that I had really seen a nightmare that felt real. I believed so for many, many years. However, that changed. My brother came to visit me yesterday. Nowadays, I live in the capital of my country, far from my mother and father, because I go to university. My brother broke up with his long-term girlfriend, and I promised that he could bunk in my place as long as he needed. We had a lot of fun. Just like old times, we drank some wine and watched a movie and just talked about everything. Then we started talking about a little deeper things, which usually happens after drinking wine. I turned to look out my window. Winter was coming, and it was already dark. It brought back childhood memories. I told him about a dream I had when I was little, while looking at the street lamps outside. This darkness reminds me of when I had a nightmare as a child. I dreamed that someone screamed behind my window, and I hid in your room with you. Wasn't I a strange girl? I laughed and turned to look at my brother. My brother is now 23. He is huge. He is into bodybuilding and has a blonde beard. He looks a bit like a Viking, and I've never seen a look on him like that as an adult. He looked at me with big eyes. He was pale, like he had seen a ghost. I freaked out a little. What? I asked awkwardly. You remember that? He asked. It got quiet. What do you mean? Wasn't it a dream? I was so confused. My brother looked really startled, as if I had digged up a memory from his mind that he wanted to forget. Answer me. I thought I had a nightmare. I was startled, too. My brother shook his head. I thought you wouldn't remember that. You were so little. I hoped you would forget. My brother looked at me blankly and told me his side of the story. He told how I had fallen asleep in his arms from exhaustion. He pushed me to his bed, but didn't fall asleep himself. He sat by my side all night, like a guard dog. The morning had begun to dawn. The sound began to fade until it just disappeared. My brother still couldn't sleep. He decided to start reading comics to pass the time. In the morning, when father had come home, my brother had gone out to look for tracks, but since it had snowed all night and morning, all the tracks were covered. For the next week, my brother visited my room several times a night to make sure I was sleeping safely. We started talking more about what happened. Neither of us ever mentioned what happened to anyone. I asked him why he didn't call 112, but he just shook his head. Who would have believed me? He was right. It would have sounded like a prank invented by little boys. My brother also said he was annoyed that he didn't flash the light to the window sooner. He would have wanted to see what the creature looked like. I was just happy that I hadn't seen anything. I'm also happy to know I'm not crazy. It wasn't a dream. I have a witness. My brother experienced it too, and he remembers it better than I do. No one else has to believe me. No one else would believe me. Of course, it's also possible that somehow we created the whole thing in our heads. We have no physical evidence of what happened. And it happened years ago. It's very possible that we were just kids with overactive imaginations. I'm certainly not denying that possibility. However, I'm interested to know if anyone else has experienced something similar. And if you have, did you see it? That creature? And if you did, what did it look like?
I am Tennessee, a Native American who has always felt a deep connection to the forest. As a child, I spent many hours exploring the woods, listening to the songs of the birds and feeling the gentle breeze on my face. I knew every inch of the forest, or so I thought, until one night when I had an encounter that changed everything. I was out in the woods, hunting for deer, when I heard a strange noise. It was a low, guttural growl that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I knew that sound, but it was impossible. It was the growl of a bipedal brown Bigfoot, a creature that I had only heard of in legends. As I stood there, frozen with fear, the creature appeared before me. It was massive, towering over me at nearly eight feet tall. Its eyes glowed in the darkness, and I could see its powerful muscles rippling beneath its fur. I felt like I was facing an otherworldly creature. The creature bared its teeth, growling menacingly. I tried to back away slowly, but it took a step forward, blocking my path. I knew that if it wanted to, it could easily overpower me. I was powerless, stuck in place with nowhere to go. Suddenly the creature turned and ran off into the forest. I stood there trembling and trying to catch my breath, wondering what had just happened. I had encountered a bipedal brown Bigfoot and lived to tell the tale. Over the next few days I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I heard strange noises and saw shadows moving in the trees. I knew that the creature was still out there somewhere in the forest, and I was never sure when it would make its presence known again. From that day on, I never went into the woods alone, and always kept my senses sharp, knowing that I might encounter the creature again. I had experienced something that most people only hear about in legends, and it had changed me forever. In 2020, my mom and I decided to go on an overnight camping trip together on the Oregon coast. I picked a, what looked like a pretty campsite from a campsite app, and, and off we went. When we got there, we realized it was right off the highway, but there were enough trees and a fence up front that you couldn't really see the road. But the gate was just a metal gate that swung into place, no locks. There was a house on either side, but the property was fenced in on both sides. We pitched the tent pretty far back, close to the woods on the back of the property. Because this house was about 100 yards away, and the highway was about 200 yards, but again it was all mostly fenced in and surrounded by tall firs. It was a lovely sight, and my mom raved about how beautiful and peaceful it was. I will say that I got a feeling of dread as soon as we walked onto the property, but we arrived late, and I didn't know if we'd be able to get a new spot quickly. My mom could tell I was nervous, but for some reason I put her enjoyment of the beauty of the campsite over my feeling of dread. We made a nice campfire and enjoyed some hot chocolate as we watched the fire. I kept an eye out and didn't see or hear anything odd. My mom went to bed before I did, and I stayed up and watched the fire for a long time before going to bed. Finally, I tucked in very exhausted from staying up. At about 2 a.m. I awoke to twigs snapping and what sounded like someone dragging their fingers on the side of the tent up to the front. I sat up and grabbed up phone and the only weapon I had, a large flashlight, and unzipped my sleeping bag in case I needed to fight anyone. There was a full moon that night and I couldn't tell if it was a, a person's shadow falling on the tent or if it was a tree branch shadow moving from the wind. It sounded like there were two people outside trying to be quiet. We had brought our boots inside, so there was no indicator outside of who was in the tent. It felt like they were trying to gauge the tent while I was listening for where they were. I had made sure to make enough noise so they knew someone inside was alert, but no more than that. If they know someone is awake, they can't surprise us. But they also don't know who is inside and whether or not we have guns. I sat there in the dark until dawn, and my mom slept through the whole thing. When we got up and out of the tent, small things had been moved. Our camp chairs had cup holders. One cup that had been in a cup holder was on the ground. 
A pen that had been in a cup holder was also on the ground. My mom raves about how good her sleep was and how refreshing it was to camp there, so I didn't want to burst her bubble or scare her. We packed up and I didn't tell her, but let her have a nice memory of deep rest and relaxation while camping on this beautiful property. Was it someone living in the woods? Someone walking down the highway in the middle of the night? Creepy neighbors. Who knows? My mom got a great experience and I got her a refund and a fear of camping. The property owner said they might set up cameras to keep an eye on things in the future. People scare more than almost anything else that could be out there. Anyway, listen to your gut. We should have found another campsite or at least a hotel. The weight of modern society bore down on me. Its pressures and expectations suffocating my spirit. I yearned for the simplicity of nature, where the only rules were those dictated by the earth itself. And so, I left my old life behind, retreating deep into the remote forest to live off the land. As I settled into my new life, I found solace in the rhythm of the wild. Each day brought new challenges, but also a profound sense of satisfaction. I built a small cabin, hunted for food, and tended to my modest garden. The forest became my sanctuary, and I felt more alive than ever before. But my newfound peace was soon shattered. I stumbled upon a series of grisly killings, the remains of both animals and humans torn apart by some unknown force. The carnage pointed to the presence of a cryptid stalking the woods, a creature that defied explanation. Determined to protect my sanctuary, I called upon my skills in camouflage, tracking and hunting to systematically hunt down the creature. The forest became a battlefield, the silence punctuated by the sounds of our deadly game of cat and mouse. Finally, I cornered the cryptid, my heart pounding in my chest as I raised my weapon. But in that moment, I saw something in the creature's eyes that gave me pause, a flicker of intelligence and awareness that I had never seen in any animal before. I realized that this cryptid was a sentient being and that we needed to communicate to resolve our conflict. I lowered my weapon and began to carefully study the sounds and calls of the predator's natural prey, learning to mimic them with remarkable accuracy. By using these sounds, I was able to confuse and disorient the cryptid, drawing it out of its hiding place and making it vulnerable to attack. But I did not strike. Instead, I used this opportunity to show the creature that I meant it no harm. As we cautiously studied each other, a mutual understanding began to develop. The cryptid recognized that I was not a threat, and in turn, I came to understand its motivations and the reasons behind the killing. We forged an uneasy truce, born from a mutual respect for the power and beauty of the wilderness. I returned to my life in the forest, the cryptid continuing its own existence in the shadows. We each knew that we were part of a greater tapestry, woven together by the wild bound by the understanding that we were both children of the earth. And as I stood in the heart of the forest, I felt a deep sense of gratitude for the lessons it had taught me. For in the wild there are no enemies or allies, only the eternal dance of life and death, and the wisdom that comes from knowing one's place within it. Thanks for listening, cowboys and cowgirls. Hope you enjoyed these stories. Tomorrow we dive deep into horror of American countryside. See you then.